precious Heavenly Father, we come to you and say, Lord, we've needed your help all the way through this time. We need it now. We need it so we don't lose focus. We don't take our eye off the ball. Yes. Rather, we don't take our eye off you. And Lord, we pray that you would yet do something in us, mm. Lord, uh, through whether it's the word or the prayer time afterwards, Lord, mm. and that you would yet bring us somewhere uh, and enable us to get somewhere with you, wherever that might be. We appeal to you, Lord, for help. Help me as I bring the word. Help us all as we listen to what you're saying, how you might apply it to the prayer time afterwards, but particularly how you might apply it to us generally, to our hearts, to our prayer lives, to everything. Lord, we appeal to you to be with us and help us through your word in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Do you take your seats, please? <coughs> so we've had... Uh, obviously, two talks already in this series on God's judgment. In the first talk, very, very briefly as a reminder, we looked at our attitudes or questioned our attitudes to God's judgment, asking really, uh, have our attitudes been corrupted, whether through the wrong understanding of the Old Testament and the New, whether by our culture, which doesn't like being told it's wrong and doesn't like to contemplate suffering, um, and is naturally programmed to assume that all suffering is unjust. And we saw that our own emotions and pity, good though they can be, can also get in the way uh, of us appreciating and acknowledging and accepting and praising God's judgment. Um, and also that we can sort of lack a zeal for God. Uh, and our zeal for people who we are living amongst and who we relate to can outweigh our zeal for God when it should be the other way around. Yeah. We saw the need to make sure that we had a spiritual mindset like those saints set free from the fleshly mindset in heaven in Revelation. Mm -hmm. And we saw that a right attitude accepts and acknowledges God's judgment as right. Mm -hmm. uh, that that same understanding will sometimes, when it's appropriate, pray for judgment, which might be working against our flesh, which yeah. we didn't want it. There may even be times when it's appropriate to desire or rejoice in judgment. Yeah. Hard though it can be to understand that. And as I said in that first talk, these talks perhaps raise as many questions as they do answers for us to weigh up. Particularly as I won't have grasped everything properly. Mm -hmm. So I'm, if anything, putting the thoughts out there. Um, and of course everything we say from the front uh, must be tested. Even if there's a grain of truth somewhere, it doesn't mean it's all true. So you need to weigh every scripture that we've brought and every comment we've made. Um, but whatever is of the Lord, may it bear fruit. In the second talk, having considered what our attitudes can be to God's judgment, we then thought about what are God's attitude, what's God's emotions in the context of judgment. We saw that God does not enjoy judgment, and he asks that of people who doubt him, say, do I enjoy, do I take pleasure in people's death, even the wicked's death? No, he desires all to come to repentance. So we saw he doesn't enjoy it. He also doesn't act in great outbursts of sudden wrath. Uh, his wrath can fall suddenly, but that is not a sudden reaction. That is not a, an outburst of uncontrollable anger. We saw that God is very patient. But on the other hand, we see that God's emotions are stirred by sin. He is deeply gr uh, grieved, even broken in some sense, by the sin of everyone. That includes our sin, not just the wicked, who we like to think of as, as them over there, them doing that particular thing now. But all of us naturally break God's heart with our sin. And we saw that God's anger, although it is patient and although it's in control, can be fiery hot, very fierce. Sometimes even literally burning people in the Old Testament and in the time to come. And we saw, therefore, that uh, God's anger is something to reckon with, but that in Christ, although we deserve to feel the full fire of his wrath, just like anybody else, mm -hmm. in Christ we can stand and not be burnt, because Jesus faced the full fire of God's wrath for the whole of humanity in some way we cannot understand that surely went beyond the pain of the crucifixion. All of that was what we've considered so far. Having considered uh, our attitudes to God's judgment and then God's attitude and emotions in judgment, today we're going to consider God's methods, or at least start to consider some of the principles 
of how God's judgment works. The first principle that we're going to consider is that God's judgment is fair and measured. God's judgment is fair and measured. I've already referred in one of the other talks to Revelation 16 and verses 4 to 7. Revelation 16 and verses 4 to 7, which is where people in heaven are looking at what God has done in turning the rivers to blood. This is in a day still to come, whether or not we, uh, well, well, we won't get into where we'll be and whether we'll be here, but the rivers will be turned to blood and the people in heaven say to the Lord, you are righteous, they deserve it. They deserve for the rivers to be turned to blood because they had spilled the blood of God's saints on the earth. And they, they in heaven recognised this principle that God was giving what they were due. They had spilled the Lord's blood, therefore they were drinking blood. When Abimelech uh, makes a plot with the men of Shechem in the Old Testament... Uh, and then things go all the, way, all the way between them, and they consume each other. It says that God rendered the evil of the men of Shechem on their own heads. They had killed Gideon's sons, all but one, on one stone, in collaboration with Abimelech. And God rendered it on their own heads. They died as a result. We see also the passage uh, in Isaiah 63, where... The, the lifeblood of the Lord's enemies is sprinkled on his garments. He's treading the great winepress of God's wrath. And again, we can consider how just that is, because in other parts of the <coughs> prophets, it talks about how many in Israel had shed innocent blood. Their hands were covered in blood. So it was only righteous for God to deal with those who had shed blood by shedding their blood. <coughs> The principle of a fair and measured judgment in response to what had been done is laid down by the Lord in the, in the law of Moses when he talks about an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. This idea that whatever has been done, to, done by somebody of violence, the same is to be done back to them. Now we are called to live in a different way towards our enemies now. If somebody hits us, rather than seeking to get them hit back, we're actually to turn the other cheek. I say that as somebody who would really struggle to do that. But that is what we are called to do. How that works in an age where we naturally reach for the courts the moment there is an injustice, I don't know. But I, we know that we are called to live in a different way now. But God's justice and his ways have not changed. Just because he's not calling us to carry out that same law about the eye for eye and a tooth for tooth, it doesn't mean that the principle it teaches about God has changed in any way. As we've seen in Revelation, uh, the Lord giving people according to what they had done. So the Lord's judgment pays back people what they have done. We should also recognise that God measures all of our sins. Of course, for us as believers, we can know that being forgiven. Mm -hmm. But in Revelation 20 and verse 12, Revelation 20 and verse 12, it says that the dead are going to be judged by their deeds, which are written in books. Mm -hmm. Now, why would God write books? God remembers everything. He doesn't need books. <laughs> I'm relying to, to a large extent on things I've written down here so that I remember stuff and I still forget stuff even with it there. But God doesn't need anything written down. He's not done this for his own sake. It's been written for us now and it will be the case in the time to come because God wants everybody to realise he's not just guessed how much people need judgment. He's not just rounded it down or up to the nearest sin, if I can put it that way. He has recorded everything. There's a wonderful passage in Colossians that talks about, uh, I can't remember the phrasing, 
but the, the things that were against us and the Lord has nailed it to his cross. So the wonderful thing is that that huge list of our sins, which is still being added to now because we're not perfect yet, that huge list of sins, if we carry on in faith and seeking the Lord's forgiveness, has been and will be forgotten. But for everybody else, the Lord has those deeds recorded. And Matthew 12 and verse 36, Matthew 12 and verse 36 says that men will give account for every careless or useless word. It says, for by their words they'll be justified, by their words they'll be condemned. That's talking about words, revelation, talk about deeds. But the point there is that everyone is reckoned by the Lord. Did you notice that God came down to visit Sodom before judging it? He didn't need to do that. But he said to Abraham, I've come down to be sure, or whatever the phrase was, to make sure and see if the outcry is totally in the way that I have heard it. I believe that was, again, for the benefit of man, not God's benefit, but for man to see God didn't lash out because he had heard second hand that there was something bad in Sodom. God saw everything and it reached that point where he knew it was enough. <clears throat> Isaiah 65 and verse 7 says, I will measure their work into their bosom. And when it's, any time you've got a scripture talk about putting something in somebody's bosom, it's the idea that they, in the clothing that they had, they would have a fold they could make in it to carry grain or whatever was measured into it. Um, so you'd hold it out, and uh, a bit like Boaz did for Ruth, and they'd carry it. God is going to measure. God is able to measure things back. There's a picture here of a God of detail. Having said that, there are indications in the Bible that sometimes God gives beyond what somebody has done. In Revelation 18, in the passage about Babylon, in verses 5 to 7, it speaks about the judgment of Babylon. Revelation 18, verses 5 to 7, and it says, Pay Babylon back as she's paid, and give her back double according to her deeds. To the degree she glorified herself and lived sensuously, to the same degree give torment and mourning. There's an indication there of giving back exactly what they deserve, but also an, an idea of double. And it says a similar thing about the Israelites in Jeremiah 16 and verse 18. Jeremiah 16 and verse 18. That the Lord was going to repay the Israelites double for their sins. So God's judgment is measured, fair, examined, carefully thought out. But sometimes God goes further. And I think it was mentioned earlier in the conference, the idea that Pharaoh hardened his heart and God hardened it further. That's the first principle we're considering God's judgment. That it is thorough, fair and measured. The second principle is that God's judgment is complete. Sometimes it comes gradually. The Israelites were told by Moses that if they rebelled, the Lord would bring a certain measure of judgment, and if they didn't turn, he'd bring more, and if not, more. So there is that idea, sometimes it's gradual. Sometimes it falls all at once, like with Sodom. They didn't know anything of judgment until it was burned up. But whichever way it comes, God's judgment is complete. In Revelation 15 and verse 1, it speaks about the bowls of wrath. The bowls of wrath. And it says about those seven bowls, in them the wrath of God is complete, or finished, or fulfilled. And we know, when I say we know, we often hear it said that the number seven often speaks in the Bible of perfection or completeness. There are seven bowls of wrath. There are also seven trumpets. There were seven seals, all connected in some way with judgment at least. But particularly those bowls of wrath, it says in them, and the Lord has already brought other things, we can see in Revelation, but in them, and particularly by the time the seventh bowl has been poured out, God's wrath is 
complete. Didn't fall all at once, but the Lord was going to do a complete job of judging the earth. And as the final bowl is poured out in verse 17, in Revelation 15 and verse 17, a voice comes from the throne saying, it is done. I don't want to trivialise this, but if you've ever been working on a big project, uh, whether it's a long essay um, or a big DIY project or whatever, and you do the final nail or the final word or whatever it might be, and you put down your tool or your pen or your laptop and you say, it's finished. And there's a sigh of relief. I don't want to say that's the nature of God there, but it's like God says, finally, it is done. His wrath has been complete. He didn't do a half job. He didn't give up part way through because he got tired or bored. If I can put it that way. His job. His justice was complete. God spoke in Jeremiah 46 and verse 28 about making a complete end of other nations. Although he wasn't going to do that of Israel. I don't think it was that Israel was more righteous than other nations. But God had made a covenant promise and he was trying to do things through Israel and be a picture to them. God would have been right to have made a complete end of Israel as well. In his mercy... He chose to not do that. But he could have done. And so there's that reminder. We can always pray for mercy. We can pray for our nation. The Lord may relent. But if the Lord brings a complete judgment, he is right to do it. And anything less than that is God holding back and being merciful. Not God going over the top for those who he judges completely. And we read in Nahum the other night Nahum 1 and verse 9 whatever you devise against the Lord he will make a complete end of it distress will not rise up twice it says no matter what you do God will finish things and he will do it completely now there's a really important principle I believe here about the completeness of God's judgment and it's one to take note of if we struggle ever with the idea of God's judgment and how we can perceive it to be harsh or whatever our flesh and our earthly minds it can say we praise God for his righteousness don't we very often and his perfection if God's judgment isn't complete his righteousness isn't complete either I think it's worth saying again if God's judgment isn't complete his righteousness isn't complete either if God doesn't utterly judge at times, he is not utterly righteous. Mm. And there was this idea mentioned of yesterday of the Lord being the same yesterday, same forever, that he is already perfect. He doesn't need improving. There's no way that you can improve him. He is already a perfectly formed diamond, if we can put it that way. But if he doesn't judge, there is an imperfection in that diamond. Perhaps this at least partly helps us understand the need for those Canaanite cities to be utterly destroyed. If God had just said, well, just subjugate them, then God's righteousness wasn't complete. After all the gross sins of those nations, including burning their children in the fire, anything less than that might have given the impression to those nations that God was a bit righteous, but not fully. As it was, the surrounding nations heard what God did, and I'm sure feared him. And we should also say that when we talk about the completeness of God's judgment, it includes the complete certainty of judgment. In that passage, which I'm referring to sometimes in Exodus, where the Lord describes his character, he says, I will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. I will by no means leave them unpunished. I'm afraid it's going to come up later in my notes, so when we get there, we'll find it. But let's move on. Could I encourage you to turn your phone on silent, please? We've had a few disruptions already this morning. I appreciate it if you could turn that so that we don't have the noises. Thank you. So we can hear just God's voice, hopefully. The next principle, the last main one really, but I want to dwell on the rest of the time, is that the cup of God's wrath is filled up over time. Mm. 
The cup of God's wrath is filled up over time. And the big key scripture for this that I want to begin this with is Genesis 15 and verse 16. Genesis 15 and verse 16. Where God tells Abraham, his descendants are going to inherit the promised land. But he says they're going to go to Egypt for a time. 400 odd years actually. Because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. The iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. I'm sure the Amorites speaking of all the different nations within Canaan. That is such a small phrase. And yet, as I was looking at this principle particularly, I particularly looked at what a few different commentators said about some of these things. And one described this as one of the pivotal sayings of the Old Testament. Saying that it paints Joshua's invasion as an act of justice, not aggression. Because it's saying here that it's not just that God said, I'm going to move the Israelites into the land, and whatever the people there are like, I'm just going to kill them off because I'm more interested in the people of Israel. No. This is saying that there's going to come a time when the iniquity of the Amorites will have reached such a level that God has to judge them. And he worked that in in combination with his purpose of bringing the Israelites into the land. But it wasn't just for the sake of making Israel to have a homeland. Mm -hmm. yeah. The iniquity of the Amorites was not yet complete. Friends, they were given 400 years or so. Mm -hmm. That's a long time. Mm -hmm. A long time of mercy. And that cup was filling up and filling up. God was saying to Abraham, it's not yet complete. It gives the impression that it was already a bit filled up in Abraham's day. God's saying, I've got another 400 years to go. I hope the Lord's not got another 400 years for us here. We obviously see increasing signs of the end times. And yet, we shouldn't be surprised if there's a long time to go. Because the Lord, as we know, when he talks in the New Testament to Peter about that promise of his coming, he says, um, the Lord is not willing for any to perish mm -hmm. that's what he says and that's why the Lord is seeming to be slow as some people see it mm -hmm. so God says to Abraham the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete mm -hmm. it shows the extent of God's mercy to the Amorites not just that they got 400 years but that the Lord made his special people wait all that time mm -hmm. for some of that time in bondage to the Egyptians mm -hmm. so that they would have chance to repent And I just raised the question about whether there's a parallel there for us as believers. That if we wait a long time and suffer, and many in the persecuted church feel they've been suffering a long time already. Mm -hmm. The Lord has already laid a principle in scripture that he may make his chosen people, his servants. I'm not equating us with Israel, of course, but there's a parallel, isn't there? He can make his chosen people wait for the promised land, for the inheritance, because he's giving the wicked, if I can put it that way more time yeah. to repent mm. may that strengthen us if we go through a long time of persecution and if we go through the tribulation God takes a long term view and that's unsurprising when 2 Peter 3 and verse 9 tells us that a thousand years are like a day to the Lord and a day like a thousand years mm. 400 years is nothing to him in a sense but God takes that long term view he doesn't just want to give people a moment to repent how often he wants it to be that they're given a chance. But it does build up over time. It says in Revelation 18, in that passage I referred to earlier, that Babylon's sins had piled up to heaven, therefore pay them back as they have paid. Piled up. People talk about dirty laundry piling up, and it reaches a level where the washing machine needs to be put on. But here it's Babylon's sins piling up. And I've spoken already about the cup of God's wrath, and of course a cup is filled up, but there reaches a point where as you keep pouring in, it overflows. God's cup is 
very large, but it's not infinite. Mm -hmm. Certainly not towards the wicked. And there comes a point where it overflows. In Ezekiel 5 and verse 13, Ezekiel 5 and verse 13, it talks about how God, God's anger is going to be spent or satisfied or appeased. And there's this idea that the judgment builds up to a level and then it must be poured out. And finally, when it's been empty, the Lord can say, my wrath has now been appeased. Notice it, there's a difference between being appeased and being pleased. God does not enjoy or gain pleasure from judgment, but there is a sense in which his wrath is appeased, in which his wrath is satisfied. However reluctantly on the Lord's part, his wrath is satisfied when finally, after holding it back for so long, it's poured out. And I was just imagining this picture of a dam and water building up behind the dam. And then there comes a point where it either overflows the dam or the dam bursts. And if we, as God's people, could see visually the dam and the amount of water built up behind it of God's judgment and anger upon this nation, it, I'm sure we'd pray a lot more. I'm sure I would pray a lot more. We can just get so used to the sins of the world. Yes. But if we saw the judgment piling up and the cup and how full it's getting, yeah. I'm sure we'd pray a lot more. David, when um, he was judged or, or the nation was judged, the Lord um, used the enemy and David in some way to bring about uh, a judgment on Israel uh, through that census that David brought um, and David obviously recognised he'd done wrong, but there came a moment when he saw the angel, where the Lord had brought the angel to a stop before the angel destroyed Jerusalem. And suddenly David sees the judgment impending on Jerusalem, and he cries out more to the Lord. He'd already recognised his sin, but something of seeing God's judgment looming changed things further for him. And may the Lord bring that about for us. So we see that the cup is filled up over time. And we see an indication of this in the case of Manasseh. Because in 2 Kings 23 and verse 26, 2 Kings 23 and verse 26, we see that although Josiah was a, generally a good king, and it gives us the hope that the Lord can allow or bring about a measure of I don't say revival necessarily, but a measure of turning back, um, uh, even when judgment is, is uh, about to fall, we see that that was the case for Josiah, and he brought about some good in his reign, but in that verse it says, despite Josiah's good reign and the reforms at that time, God wasn't willing to turn from the fierceness of his anger against Judah because of Manasseh's sins and bloodshed and provocations. Manasseh, amazingly, was forgiven personally. Well, because of his sins, and I'm sure not just his sins, but others working with him. After all, Manasseh didn't personally go around killing all the people he did. His servants must have been involved. Because of the sins of Manasseh primarily and those involved with him, God wouldn't turn from the fierceness of his anger. His cup was filling up had even to a certain extent been fully filled up. He didn't pour it out straight away. There was time here for uh, at least a reviving in a measure, but it was going to be poured out. And let's not kid ourselves. We thank the Lord for every mercy he shows our nation, but it doesn't mean that the Lord has forgotten his anger. It doesn't mean that judgment is not going to fall. It just encourages us that God is not willing to let that judgment fully fall on us yet. Yeah. And that principle of Manasseh we see in Numbers 35 at the end of the chapter where it says, No expiation can be made on the land for the blood that is shed except by the blood of the murderer. There's that principle there that the blood defiles the land. 
Now there are two aspects to this of the cup. There's a positive and a negative, if I can say that. The positive is that for many people they get given a long time to repent. And that for some generations they don't see the full judgment of their actions. But the negative is somewhere down the line, for either those people or for generations to come, judgment is going to fall heavily. And it's not quite a separate point, but if I can move on to a related final point really, is that the Bible talks about the sins of the fathers being visited on the children. I'm aware I've not really read out any scriptures in full today. Let me read one of them. Exodus 34, I think this was the reference which was asked for earlier. Exodus 34 and verses 6 to 7. Exodus 34, verses 6 to 7. Exodus 34, verses 6 to 7. We see here that Moses, having prayed previously for the Lord to show his glory, well, he got a bit more than he bargained for. I don't think he asked the Lord to show him his judgment. But this is all wrapped up in the Lord's glory. We see judgment as a negative, but there is a positive to it in the sense that it shows God's righteousness. Uh, and all part of his amazing character <coughs> and his standards. But God in response reveals himself to Moses and proclaims in verse 6, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression and sin, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. <coughs> visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth <coughs> generations. I'm going to make a feeble attempt to explain this. Thank it you. definitely needs explaining yeah. and understanding. Yeah. Certainly something which perhaps we struggle with when we consider it. What does it mean? Well, it's been pointed out by others that for a start... Sometimes, whether or not through God's particular intervention, when parents do something, it naturally is inflicted on their children. It's naturally inflicted just in human life. For example, when a child is born illegitimately. Not so much the case right now, people don't seem that bothered, but certainly in the past, if you were born illegitimately, you as the child might be looked down on, might be shut out of things. There's a suggestion, an implication in scripture that Jesus was looked down on uh, for the fact that it was reported that he had been born illegitimate. Naturally, that can be <coughs> and end up being a judgment. Um, not saying that the Lord necessarily does that, but perhaps the Lord set in motion the general principle that very often children suffer because of their parents. If parents do something wrong and go in prison, their children miss them. They don't have their parents in their lives. When sometimes, in particular in the past, parents were convicted of treason and executed, their children, if they had titles, would forfeit them. And various other things we consider. We could consider poverty. We could pray about gambling last night. If parents lose all their money, the children end up poor. Mm. If parents engage in certain sexual sins, the children, I'm no expert on this, but I think I'm right in saying that sometimes it can be passed on yes. to the children. Yes. Yes. When parents drink, when mo mothers drink during pregnancy, yes. it can affect Definitely. the children. And it has implications for their education and all kinds of other things. Just in the natural way of things, as some have called it, there is a picture of this happening. We might at this point consider an objection or at least a question about how this fits in with something else the Lord said. Because in Deuteronomy 24 and verse 16, Deuteronomy 24 and verse 16 God commanded that fathers should not be put to death for the children or children for the fathers. Mm -hmm. Recognising that that was sometimes a practice in those days. And it was later as well. 
that, and it is in North Korea, I believe, right now. Whole family units are sent to prison because somebody has done something wrong, had a Bible, or escaped, or whatever they might be. So it's not just in the past. But God says that's not the way you're to do things. And in Ezekiel 18, it says, I'm sorry I've not got the verse, but in Ezekiel 18, it says, um, because the, the people are saying this phrase, that the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth have been set on edge. And God says, actually, no, you're not going to keep saying that because the soul that sins shall die. The soul that sins shall die. So God in those places putting a principle that each person is responsible for their own sin, as a New Testament verse that says everyone will bear their own load. And that's a principle, clearly. We can't, um, we can't uh, gain salvation for somebody else. Scripture said no man can, by any means, save his brother. We can't repent in its fullest sense of making that turning that Josh was speaking about the other day on someone else's behalf. They themselves need to have a change of mind. And so, clearly that's a principle. But then, in this passage we've been considering, in Exodus 34, it talks about God visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children. Now, how does that work? Well, let's consider a couple of other references. In Lamentations chapter 5 and verse 7, Jeremiah the prophet says, Our fathers sinned, it is we who have borne their iniquities. But then in verse 16, he says, Woe to us, for we have sinned. Mm -hmm. Jeremiah recognises that to a certain extent they're bearing their father's sins, but that they also deserve judgment because mm -hmm. they have sinned. <clears throat> and there's a passage where it's almost like God is addressing this, um, this question directly. If I can just find where it's moved to in my notes. Jeremiah 16 and verses 10 to 12. Jeremiah 16 and verses 10 to 12. Where the people say, why has the Lord declared all this great calamity against us and what is our iniquity? And in verse 11, God says, it is because your forefathers have forsaken me and followed other gods and served them and bowed down. And then in verse 12, God says, you too have done evil, even more than your forefathers. God says, the reason I'm judging you is because your fathers sinned, and you have carried on sinning and gone even further. And I believe this starts to give us a picture of why God, who says each one will die for their own sin, also talks about the fathers, uh, the children bearing the sins of the fathers. Let's turn to Matthew 23. Matthew 23. Here again, as I mentioned in the first talk, God takes an Old Testament principle about judgment that we might find uncomfortable. He doesn't do away with it as the Jesus of love in the New Testament. He affirms it. Matthew 23. And verse... 32. The Lord has been upbraiding the scribes and Pharisees with seven woes. I won't go into it. It might appear in some versions there's eight, but one of them seems to have been added from another passage. So I'll just throw it out in passing that the Lord has just pronounced seven woes on the Pharisees. Seven bowls of wrath. You get the, the indication there. And then the Lord says in verse 31. So you testify against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of the guilt of your fathers. You serpents, you brood of vipers, how will you escape the sentence of hell? Therefore, behold, I am sending you prophets and wise men and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city, so that upon you may fall the guilt of all the righteous blood shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. 
And then as a reminder, the Lord isn't doing this heart, um, kind of from a cold heart. The Lord goes on to lament over Jerusalem. If only they would turn. But they're not going to, he knows. So he's going to judge them. But we see here, the Lord says, fill up the measure of your father's guilt. It's like the Lord is talking about that cup of wrath. And saying, your father's filled it up. There's a bit more to go. Finish the job, the Lord is saying. That's a terrible thing to be said. He mentions Abel and Zechariah. We might note that Abel, as when he died, it says in Genesis 4 and verse 10, that Abel's blood cried out from the ground, almost saying, avenge me. Cain didn't die, interestingly, for that. I don't want to go into that further, but it's just an interesting point. Cain didn't die. He was judged, but he didn't die. Zachariah, there's two Zacharias that um, we might think of. Um, and I won't go into the question of which it is. Um, but people believe that whatever the name given here, that it was Zachariah in 2 Chronicles 24 and verse 22. 2 Chronicles 24 and verse 22. Who, as he died, as he a priest was put to death, the son of Jehoiada, he said, may the Lord see and avenge. How interesting. From the blood of one whose, whose blood cried out to the ground, to the blood of the other who said, may the Lord see and avenge. Well, the Lord had seen. He did judge the king who killed him. But the Lord also shows here he had taken note. Now, I don't know the ins and outs of how this works for that generation. But we can see the general principle, can't we? The Lord saying that they were filling up the measure of their father's guilt. And as we put this together, we see they hadn't learned or repented of their father's sins. And this is how we see how the two things come together of the children bearing the father's sins, but also the children being sinners themselves. Their fathers had murdered the prophets. They were going to go one better, or one worse, I should say. They were going to kill the one true prophet. They were going to kill the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. They, had, they hadn't learned. They were not just walking in their father's sins. They were going further. And then they were going to kill these various prophets, that, and wise men and scribes that the Lord says he's going to send to them. If that generation had turned and spared Jesus and his witnesses, surely that judgment wouldn't have fallen on them. Although arguably it would have fallen at some point on someone because it was building up. But the Lord called it an evil and adulterous generation. Just one other picture that may help us here. I did notice, looking at the kings of Judah, we've got Ahaz at one point, who is bad. We're going to call them baddies and goodies. Uh, simplifies things a bit. Ahaz was bad. Then Hezekiah was good. Then Manasseh was bad for a long time. He repented, of course. Then Ammon was bad. And then Josiah was good. Ahaz bad. Hezekiah good. Manasseh bad most of the time. Ammon bad. Josiah good. Hezekiah and Josiah were not judged. Although their fathers, Ahaz and Ammon, were bad. So God didn't judge those children for their father's sins because they were righteous. But the interesting thing about Ammon is he, oh bless you, is that he only lasted two years. Manasseh's reign was ages long. I've forgotten, is it 50 years? Something like that? 55, thank you. He, he lasted a long time. Now I don't know at what point he was judged and repented and turned. I don't know what proportion of his reign was wickedness, but the Lord certainly gave him a long time to repent. Ammon saw his father's sins, saw his repentance, didn't turn, and was only given two years. Ahab's son similarly lasted just two years. Ahab was given chances to repent, and at one point partially turned, and the Lord postponed his judgment, but his son carried on and was judged. Nebuchadnezzar, given chances to repent, praise the Lord, he did repent in the end. His son or grandson, whoever it was, Belshazzar, had seen that, and, and Daniel himself pointed this out. He had seen it, he didn't change, 
he was judged that night. Yes. Mm -hmm. He wasn't given the chance his fathers were given. And we see this principle illustrated, don't we? Well, I've, uh, I've run out of time. But I just want to conclude with a practical connection for our time today. There are those who believe there will be a massive revival and a Christianization of nations before Christ's return. Now we could point out errors in that from in other ways and in more specific ways, but I just want to add one point. God may grant a measure of revival in pockets, and there's great revivals in certain parts of the world. But ultimately God has to judge the world for all its evils. God would not be just if he allowed the whole world just to become Christianised and forgot about all the nation's sin. And so, with a certain amount of trepidation, I bring you this metre. However accurate, it's been fairly well researched, but this tells us the number of abortions worldwide so far this year. This year. Worldwide. For the benefits of those listening on YouTube afterwards, let me click every time it reckons an abortion is happening. Fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. Shall I not be avenged on a world such as this? God would surely ask the church. And we don't have a counter for the sins of this nation. But, if I remember rightly, it's probably something like one every second or one every few seconds in this nation. And of course we add it to nine million, I think we're near, very near ten million in this nation. We have no excuses as a nation. We have had more and more scientific revelations that show the nature of the baby in the womb. So we're even more guilty than our fathers might have been. We've got more and more, we've had so much pro-life activity, although it always, always needs to be more. Shall I not be avenged on a united kingdom <clears throat> such as this? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, where we're not moved by this, we need to be. Lord, we need to be moved and we appeal to you to do that. Lord, that just as David saw the angel, he knew there was sin in, in what he had done. He knew the nation was being judged, but then he saw the judgment. And Lord, just as Josiah heard when that book of the law was found and he heard and he sent me to prophet and recognised great is the Lord's judgment against us. And there was that sudden realisation. We pray for that realisation in us. I pray for myself, Lord, that my cold heart would be moved. Amen. We pray that our cold hearts would be moved. Amen. Lord, as we've considered your judgment over these three talks, and be reminded in Josh's about the state of our heart. Lord, we appeal to you that we would not go away none the wiser from it. We appeal to you that you would give us an understanding, a right understanding of your judgment. Would you give us a spiritual mindset that sides with you, however painful, 
that feels your hurt over things like what's on the screen behind me. Lord, that doesn't get swayed by our culture and by our flesh. Lord, would you help us to acknowledge your judgment? Would you help us to understand it? Would you help us, where appropriate, to pray for it? But, oh Lord, would you help us to see where there's judgment that could be held back, even for a time as in Josiah's day. And would you move us to pray? It's our prayer as we're nearly going to be going away from this conference. Don't leave us in the same heart state and the same lack of understanding and lack of sight of your judgment as we came. We ask in Jesus' name. Let's just have a time of quiet, please.